Can you hear me there? Have to. So we're back. Morning session. I hope you did some thinking about the morning session, and you might have your questions ready. I suppose. But first, I'm going to talk about, as I promised in the morning. Uh, what did I promise? No, the Gita. We discussed the Gita, and I said when I come back, I'm going to talk to you about the twelfth chapter called Bhakti. Before that, may I, uh, uh, on behalf of our gathering, welcome our ambassadors from India. <clears throat> um, now, we discussed roughly about the Gita. And that it has 18 chapters, and starting with Arjuna Vishad Yoga, the sorrow of Arjuna, and then continuing. Right now, there is one chapter in the Gita called Bhakti Yoga, and this is the twelfth chapter. So usually. Bhakti, some many, very often among intellectuals, takes a back seat. I see many people who say we are Vedantins, we are yogis. Uh, there are many people who say we are bhaktas, but difficult to come by when one really is a bhakta. But that's okay. We will discuss that. Now, the question usually asked is, why did Vyasa, who of course obviously wrote the Gita, Wait till the twelfth chapter to talk about bhakti. Why couldn't he have said if it is so important? Ah, despite of, especially because of the fact that at one point in the Gita, Krishna says, "Sarva dharma anvaritve ja mahame gam saranam bracha aham to sarva paapse bio moksha ekshami masucha." Just have surrender to me. Forget all your worries. Put them all at my feet, and reach moksha. Now, this is a good definition of bhakti. Even then, why is it that they wait till the twelfth chapter to talk about bhakti? As I discussed in the morning, the first chapter, of course, is Arjuna Vishad Yoga. When sorrow strikes, one begins to think, God, now what? Is there something more to life? How do we move forward? And then it starts. The thing is, if you read the Gita carefully, you will notice that till chapter nine, the dialogue is very matter of fact, in the sense that Krishna is talking, Arjuna is listening. They are uh, he is his charioteer. Sarathi plus, they are friends. They are on equal terms. He is turning around and talking. They are relatives. They are on equal terms. They have done many things together. So, Krishna asks a question. I am sorry. Arjuna asks a question. Krishna answers. Then Arjuna says, "No, no, no. But wait. Let me discuss. I can't do. It. Okay. Then he explains to him. Everything is going on fine. Like you and me sitting here and talking to each other. Then, in the tenth chapter, suddenly uh, Krishna changes his record a bit. It's like turning the record and putting the other side. You know the old record players. Although Arjuna knows from the beginning that it is not equal terms, but he says, "Among the mountains, I am Meru. Among the Achalas, I am the Himachala. Among the Munis, I am Kapila. When did Kapila? Kapila is long before even the Ganga came down to earth. Bhagirathi, Bhagirathi." The founder of one of the most important darshanas in Indian philosophy, Sankhya, Kapila. Among the Munis, I am Kapila, and among the Vedas, I am Samaveda, and so on. So Arjuna is wondering 
He is this man. We were talking to each other. I know him so well. Now, how can he be Meru and the Himachala and uh, Kapila Muni who lived long ago? So, what is happening here is that Arjuna is beginning to wonder if the things which he thought were like 1 plus 1 is equal to 2 on the linear logic is true or not. He is getting it out now, wondering whether this man is what he appears to be or is there something else? Because you cannot sit here and say, I am the Meru. Right? So, in the 10th chapter, so-called rational framework that we create. We all have our own rational. If you talk to somebody, they say, Oh, this is my rational. I am not ready to move out of this framework. Okay? Forgetting the fact that all our rational frameworks are formed only through the data gathered by the five senses, panchendriyas, and they by themselves are not perfect. And yet we have our blueprints, right? This is... And mathematically one plus one has to be two. Now, there was one Hindi movie long, it's called Do or Do Panch, two plus two, five. Sometimes these filmmakers come out with wonderful things. <laughs> so anyway, so Arjuna, this linear logic is getting slowly shaken. He is beginning to wonder if this person sitting before me is actually what he looks like or is there something else to it. Then comes the 11th chapter. Mm -hmm. What is the 11th chapter? You know the 11th chapter. Vishwarupa Darshanam. The vision of this man sitting here being something else. The whole world is coming and going inside him. Right? There is a, we can see all the deities inside the same, coming out, going in. He sees time, he's swallowing up all the worlds. Then his so called logic is totally shattered. He understands that this thing which this man is trying to convey to me cannot be caught by the usual brain intellect. Mm -hmm. It's something outside that. But for that, one needs to have a sharp, sensitive and really intellectual understanding to go beyond the intellect. Mm -hmm. I said you in the morning, I told you, the Gayatri Japa is May my intelligence be stimulated. It's not that anybody in any part of the Indian system of thought, maybe other systems, which I am not so familiar with, have said that you should put your brain in cold storage. Yes, good. But remember that the very intelligent person very soon discovers the limitations of his or her intellectual capacity. That there is something beyond. Arjuna gets to know that only after the 10th and 11th chapter. Then begins Bhakti Yoga, 12th chapter. Till then, Vyasa had kept it on reserve. Talk to him later. Now, it begins in a very interesting way, the 12th chapter. Yes, I know you have questions, we will come after. Um, very interesting way. It's one of the few chapters which begins with Arjuna Uvacha. Arjuna said, or Arjuna's words, most chapters, most, start with Sri Bhagavan Uvacha, what Krishna says, but here Arjuna. Arjuna has an interesting question. Very interesting question. It may trouble many of us sometimes. Arjuna asks, in in the Vedas, the Upanishads, we come across so many, he doesn't use the same words, so many rishis who worship the Supreme Being or consider the Supreme Being as the formless, um, expansive, uh, infinite, almost ungraspable reality. And worship 
that supreme being that way. There are others who worship divinity in forms like you are sitting in front of me, I consider you as divine, you have a form, I worship you that way. In these two, which is the right approach? Can you tell me this? It's a question which many of us have, but sometimes we don't want to think about it. But which is the correct? Because if you tell me, I'm ready to accept it, because I've seen that you are not an ordinary being. You are something else, so you should tell me this. So Krishna, as usual, as you, you know how he behaves throughout the Mahabharata, goes about in an indirect way. Now this indirect way has its own advantages. Sometimes direct things don't register. Hmm? He goes about it in a different way. Instead of answering the question directly, he says, look, we live in this world of name and form, Nama Rupa. If one hears the name, then one registers the form. Or you know the form and you say, ah, this is so and so. So this is the world we live in, with name, Nama and Rupa, name and form. Now, to think of that Supreme Being as the ungraspable Supreme, it, which even the mind cannot understand, and Manasana Manyute, as the Upanishad says, it is very, not so easy. So it's better to have some kind of approach where there is some intimate understanding of the name and form. Name and form in this world is so important to us. If we say it is not important for us, I would say, I'm sorry, that is not true. And that is the first thing we look at in the morning when we brush our teeth. Through the wash basin, what do you look at first? My own face? My own form? I'm so attached to it. I want to see how many hairs have grown grey by then. Hmm. Is everything okay? Do I need to go to a barber? How many more wrinkles have come? Why? Because I'm so attached to my own form. And I'm saying all this is not required form. It's not easy to do that. Forms are important. Names are important. Right? So he says this approach is the easiest for you and me, normal people, form and name. Therefore, all the different mantras have been made to look at divinity in different aspects of different forms of divinity. Narayana, Shiva, Devi, there are so many interpretations to this. Don't tell me that I am not so caught up in forms. I, I have a friend in Delhi, I went to him one day, he said, I, I don't believe in all this. Uh, how did you come to believe in all this forms? I don't believe. I said, okay, fine, fine. Then he took me to his house for lunch. On every wall, there were pictures of Amitabh Bachchan hanging. I said, look, one minute, you said you don't believe in any images, in anything, any idols here. So he said, I said, maybe there's a difference between idols and matinee idols. Hmm. All human beings have some structure, some form. Why do you think in advertising we use so many pictures? The visual and the sound are very important, the names. Even in, in spiritual practices and in religions where there are no human forms, still symbols are there. Symbols are worship, right? So, he says to Arjuna, so this is a normal approach. However, it is true that the Supreme Being cannot be grasped by the ordinary mind. All that is true also, but few people can think of it that way. We heard the story of the elephant and the three blind men. So generally we end up seeing only one part. Better to hold on to it, hoping that you will see the whole. Hmm? Then he says, all that is right. But there are some attributes, qualities of a true yogi. Or a true, in this chapter, the words are interchangeable. Some places he says, Yaha bhakta same priya, this bhakta with his attributes is dear to me. 
because it is bhakti yoga chapter he says some attributes are essential in the sadhak if these attributes are there i would consider him to be the greatest of bhaktas the greatest of yogis what are the attributes it starts like this quality number 1 check the 12th chapter of a great yogi or a great bhakta one hmm samnyam indriya gramam one who has control over his emotions and his sense organs one who has control over his samnyam indriya gramam one who can gather up his indriyas where required when required not allowing the the senses to run away with the mind but rather the mind is in perfect control of the senses we're not saying it should be abandoned but it should be under one's control this quality second such a bhakta or such a yogi will be sarvatra samabuddhaya this is from the 12th chapter see the three qualities of a yogi sarvatra samabuddhaya which means unperturbed tranquil mind in the midst of all circumstances cool modern children many young people come to me and say that you cool yeah man cool meaning sarvatra samabuddhaya which means under <laughs> all circumstances you know how we lead our lives when something ex- happens and we are so excited the bp goes up after 3 days the doctor says you need to eat medicine good thing happened and then when bad things happen we are depressed and then you go to the psychiatrist he says you have to eat this you can't sleep now eat this today we were coming our friend said after a long time we slept so well i said wonderful there is no secret to it it's just that it's not worth it this this agitation is really not worth so a yogi is one whose mind is stabilized sarvatra samabuddha under all circumstances is the same you will see this throughout the mahabharat in krishna's own case the whole things are going on up hills hmm calm quiet working on it without saying anything smiling standing with folded hands and you know what we get unnecessarily agitated about it keep keep your mind in the ultimate essence we are a spark of the divine which is considered to be sachidananda through those who have experienced it that means it is consciousness and bliss that is our true identity so why what is this why are we con- getting so worked up there's nothing in the long run to be worked up about things happen which doesn't mean that you should sleep you should work but the work should not this is the secret of karma yoga that one works without getting too caught up in relaxed with so therefore sarvatra samabuddha also means he treats in some other place in the gita krishna says this yogi the real yogi has no friends or enemies they're all the same because they see only the divine spark if i see the divine in me in you and you see the divine in me friends enemies all are same because in the worst person there will be some good point somewhere look at that don't look at the other bad points recently in india we celebrated uh, yogi aurobindo's anniversary so a committee was formed a high power committee was formed and so on to celebrate it um, fortunately or unfortunately i also happened to be on the high power committee so we had a first preliminary round it was presided over by the prime minister i told them that the best thing to do for this because it also coincided with our independence you know um 
is we remember that Yogi Aurobindo, when he was Aurobindo Ghosh, was jailed by the British for the Baroda bomb case. And he was put in that high security jail in Calcutta. What is the name of the jail? I forgot. Alipur. He was in a... Who said that? Uh, and he was put in Alipur jail. So in that one year in Alipur jail, before they let him go, all this... All the cases were not cleared, but they let him go. He went off to Pondicherry because the British cannot reach a French territory. One year in the jail, he became a yogi. Right? Instead of sitting and crying about, you see, he became you know, a brave man. He became a yogi. He had a guru Maharashtra, from Maharashtra called Lile, who initiated him when he was working with the Gekod of Baroda in India. He, but he did not get enough time to practice this during his political... I don't know if you know this. He was the first man to start an English newspaper from Calcutta called Vande Mataram. He was fully involved. Then in the jail, there's nothing else to do. He started practice. When he came out, he became a yogi, so he left all politics. Became a yogi. Went to Pondicherry. So I said, I suggested that the best thing would be to send yoga teachers into prisons, okay, and teach the prisoners how to do yoga. Now, this was a suggestion from a member of the High Power Committee. Finally, it fell on our shoulders. <laughs> the Satsang Foundation was told, send all yoga teachers to jail. So, one year we were doing that. <laughs> it was good, actually, because we could, why I am saying this, we found out that there were prisoners, some of them in rigorous imprisonment, some on the death row and so on, who were actually, according, due to circumstances, they have come there. But there, there, were some, there was some spark in them. We were able to train yoga teachers from them, because we cannot continue this forever, right? So now, it's continuing. Because Nobody is totally bad. Nobody is totally good. I may also have some faults. You know, carefully, something will be there. One good or bad, I don't know, is that I always check if the crease is okay. <laughs> it may be a fault. <laughs> so, <coughs> Sarvatra Samabuddhaya. Under all circumstances, keep your mind tranquil. Now, the third, the third quality, according to Krishna, is a very interesting, very important. He said, Sarva Bhuta Hiterata, one who keeps the welfare of all living beings in their hearts. I consider such a person to be a great yogi or a great bhakta. So, as long as these attributes are not there, externally whatever bhakti we do, not much until these changes happen in us. When these changes happen, it, the mind also it frees itself from conditionings. And then it's called a surrendered mind. So, such a mind, or we have our friend here from Gujarat, I think. There was a great uh, um, saint in Gujarat, Narsi Mehta, whose beautiful song, huh? anybody knows? Vaishnava Janato Se Ne Kahi Eche Peed Parai Jane Re Paradukhe Upakar Kare Tuhi Mana Abhimana Nani Re Such a perfect description of a saint or a bhakta or a yogi, which means one who considers others' sorrows and pains as his own and tries to help him out without having a single trace of ego, saying that I have done something for him. He says that such a 
person I consider to be a devotee of the Lord. So this is, Narsi Mehta was born some years ago, 100 years ago. The Gita was, came 1000 years ago. A conservative estimate. I'm, I'm sure it was older. These are the qualities of a bhakta. And bhakti also, it means when you have understood that beyond a certain point, the brain ceases to capture and therefore comes to rest. This coming to rest is not only bhakti, it is also Vedanta. Mm-hmm. Patanjali describing yoga, defin- defining yoga says, yoga is chitta vritti nirodha. When all the vrittis of the chitta are gone and the mind becomes clear and crystal clear like a mirror, it reflects the inner self, which is the Supreme Self. Such a person, even if he looks at others, cannot see anything other than the Supreme Person. Therefore, one respects the Divine in we are walking, talking, thinking temples of the Divine. Other temples are built with rock and uh, cement and concrete. These, and they don't move, they are in one place. Here, talking, speaking, thinking, moving temples of the Divine. So a human being is so important in this context. Well, animals are also important. (laughs) Because human beings are the ones who realize this. An animal does not have the capacity to realize this. And the structure of a human being itself is such, it's the only creature, of course, occasionally the gorillas and chimpanzees do stand up. But normally, the only being, the only structure, that is built in such a way that the spine is upwards and not horizontal. I have thought about that. They stand up for a few seconds, but they have to go back, because that is their natural course. So, the movement of the mind here is this way. Here, the movement of the mind is this way. Which is why in Kriya Yoga we say that the energy should be awakened and taken up the spine. And when when we pray, we always put our hands up. Now on this, we... I want to make a... When temples are made and the deity is installed, the deities are installed as the manifestations of the Divine. Mm -hmm. So when you go to a temple, please don't close your eyes. Many people go, stand with... Image is there and the arati is done. Those days there were no electricity. Arati is done to show the deity with the fire so that you can get the complete view of the deity. It's there for you to open your eyes and see. If you want to meditate on the deity, after doing, go and sit in one corner and meditate. When your actual arati is wonderful, you know why? Because Human beings have five senses, the Indriyas. We live by our senses. Even when it is spiritual, we need some indulgence for the senses. Which is why in ancient India, all the dance forms and music forms invented, but with a divine touch to it. So that through ordinary world, we connect to the divine. Right? So, in fact, who is considered to be the greatest of dancers? in the Indian system of thought, Nataraj, Tiva himself. Not the Tandavnartha, of course, dangerous, but <laughs> Shiva himself. So, through the world, through the substance that is in front of us, to understand that which is beyond and which happens to be our inner essence, which the Nirvana Shataka describes as Chidananda Rupa Shivoham, Shivoham. I am of the nature of the Supreme. I am consciousness and bliss. I am Shivam, I am Shivam. This is the aim of spiritual practice. This is the aim, finally, the goal which the Bhagavad Gita takes you to step by step. 
and these are the qualities of a bhakta. This is what I want to do. Anyway. I said I will come back and talk to you. After that, we can field the questions. So when do you want to do that? Now? After? When? Tomorrow I am not here. Ah, uh, what? Okay. We have a break. I am always happy with breaks. <laughs> so, are we breaking now? I mean, are we having a break? Breaking is very difficult. <laughs> anyway. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. We will come back again. Have your questions ready. Don't ask for the sake of asking. But if you are serious about it, please do. And I cannot guarantee that I can answer your questions. Why? Because I haven't heard them. But hear them, if I know the answer, then we can listen. Right? Thank you.